You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lauren Delick. Well, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show for you. Go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. Any way that you download podcasts, you can listen to it there. I'd like to talk about some sponsors before we get started. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experience. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques, learn from a vast collection of free writing resources, make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.com. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've ever seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into that routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach those word count goals. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words. Stay for the fun. It's ForTheWords.com. That's the number four, TheWords.com. Writers. The internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity, but it can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat-in-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal, like spending less than one hour per day on email, to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours a day on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off our Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lauren Willig on the show with me today. Uh, Lauren has a fantastic new book called The Summer Country, and it's about colonial Barbados, which I'm really interested to talk about uh, with you today. Uh, Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to talk about The Summer Country with you. Oh, I'm excited to have you. Um, but we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Okay, well, that one's actually a really easy one for me. I wrote my first book, well, book in quotation marks. It was made of um, construction paper, and it was called something like The Sleepy Princess. It was about, of course, a princess. And I remember looking at this and thinking, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And so I did. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and um, did did anyone help you with that uh, cardboard uh, construction paper book? You know, someone must have, because I'm not sure if I was adept enough at five to staple it together myself, although maybe I was, because now I have a five-year-old, and she does these <laughs> sorts of things for herself. But, you know, I've always been better at the writing and the story spinning bit than the actual technical aspects. <laughs> so, you know, I'm the sort of person who can never tell which lever is connected to which pulley. So I'm guessing that the physical construction of the book itself, I might have had some help, but the storytelling was all me. And then, of course, you know, because I'm very stubborn – 
I decided that was why I was going to be, and I told everyone that I was going to be a writer when I grew up. And so um, I went to the same little all-girls school for 13 years, and so everyone knew <laughs> that this was what I was going to do. And they helped me along the way, which was really quite marvelous. That's fantastic. Like like on career day when everyone's taking these diagnostic tests and stuff, they're just like, oh, we'll just skip Lauren. We, we know what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best bit was my senior year. They actually let me, instead of taking a fourth class, I got to do an individual study where I wrote a novel. And that was why I had a faculty advisor who helped me with it. It was historical fiction. And so it was meant to be a combination of historical research and writing and I went, I researched Napoleon's stepdaughter, um, this woman named Hortense de Bournay. And so I researched her life and wrote a novel about her. And I, I don't know that a lot of 12th graders get that kind of opportunity. So I felt really lucky to have the chance to do a supervised practice novel. Well, that is a fantastic story. And, and one reason I ask if you had help making that book is I love to hear stories um, of when a, when a kid has this idea and, and to them it is everything. And then an adult, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a teacher, um, you know, comes by and offers some sort of encouragement that then sticks with that writer for the rest of her life. Uh, I, I know I have moments like that in my life and, and writing can be such a solitary, um, you know, there, there's a lot of dark times in, in writing um, where you just don't feel it and, and you know, you, you get that imposter syndrome and all that, and you always pull back to those memories and that early encouragement. And it sounds like you just had a lifetime full of uh, encouragement like that. Yes, and everything you're saying is so true. I think writing is something that people don't really take seriously, um, that it's viewed, even if someone is pursuing it seriously, it's often viewed as a hobby. And people are often shamed for wanting to write. So having that sort of encouragement when you're young makes a really big difference. Well, and, and uh, you know, for whatever reason, even if it is a hobby, um, we have this sort of stigma against, uh, you know, just doing things just for the enjoyment of it. Like that, like that, that doesn't offer some sort of, um, you know, thing that, that feeds our soul, you know, That's like just because it doesn't make money, but you know, not that you can't, but, but some people just want to do that just for the pure enjoyment of it. Oh, absolutely. Actually. Um, I think it was the wonderful Kate Quinn recently circulated an article on Facebook about how we've lost the art of the hobby, the idea to do something just for the joy of it, just because it makes you feel good as opposed to expecting it to suddenly turn into a small business. I mean, I think, the problem is we've fallen into the trap of thinking everything should be like that 80s movie where um, Diane Keaton starts making baby food for her child and it becomes a baby food empire. Not everything has to become a baby food empire. Sometimes you just want to make baby food to make baby food. Exactly. Well, and, you know, we, we kind of live in a weird economy right now where the, the gig economy, if you will, is, is big where, you know, people uh, do lots of little things and, and make a career of that. And, and we... You know, the, the problem with that is, like you said, that um, we, we, we blur the line between the things we'd love to do and the things that we need to do uh, to make a living. And sometimes those things intersect and we get to, to make a living from the things we love. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, that, that's a side tangent. Oh, yes. But, I mean, it's been one – it's one I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, how we really have – sort of, we, we've monetized or the idea is that we ought to be monetizing – our hobbies. I have a friend who makes gorgeous clothes, but for herself, and people keep asking her if she's going to start selling them, you know, that she should have a shop. And, you know, maybe, maybe these things don't need to be a shop. Maybe it's enough just to do it for yourself and your friends and your family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you told everyone that you were going to be a writer. Um, you know, a lot of people have that early idea. Um, but then life comes along and, um, and, you know, we feel the need to, to pursue a, a certain career and, and to get settled in life and all that. And then writing always comes back around knocking on the door and, and drags us back in. Um, it sounds like your experience is, is different. You, um, you had the senior project when you were in high school. What did you do right after high school? Well, so I went off to college where, you know, I, I was that bizarre high schooler who, instead of going off to normal summer camp where you do things like swim and get sunburned, I used to go to writer camp in the summer. So I felt like, okay, I, I had done my writer training. And so in college, I went and I majored in Renaissance studies, 
on the theory that I was going to go write a really historically accurate novel. And then I went off to do a PhD in history on the same principle because I wanted, I wanted the background info for my books. Um, but I also knew that writing is incredibly uncertain, that the odds of making a living as a writer are slim to non-existent. So once I realized I didn't actually want to be an academic <laughs> and actually professors don't really have three month long summers to write novels because they're actually meant to be working on other things. Um, I went off to law school and bizarrely enough, got my first book contract my first month of law school because fate has a wicked sense of humor that way. Uh, so what was that book that you got the uh, the contract for? Well, this was my what I call my dissertation avoidance book. Um, it's it's the, the eventual title was The Secret History of the Pink Carnation. It's a romp set in Napoleonic France. It's basically a Scarlet Pimpernel spoof with flower named spies swinging on ropes, fighting for England and thwarting Napoleon. And the reason I, I'd written it was because I had meant to write a big, thick epic about the English Civil War, which was my dissertation topic, but I was so close to it, and my head was so crammed full of footnotes that everything I wrote was boring. So I was like, okay, I have to write something just for fun to keep my love of storytelling alive, and so I wrote a swashbuckling romp about Napoleonic spies, and it was never meant to be the book. This was just the just-for-fun book that got passed around to friends. It was full of in-jokes and sheep jokes and heaving bosoms and ripped bodices. And it was really, I wrote it to entertain myself because dissertation writing can be really depressing and lonely. And um, a friend of mine happened to be friends with someone who had recently become an agent and she handed it off to him. And next thing I knew, I got a phone call saying, so I've read your book. I want to represent you, which is absolutely atypical. So that book that was the just for fun book, the never meant to become anything book actually became the first in a 12 book series. That is amazing. That is. And it's a sign that life happens when you're trying to do other things. Yes. Yes. Uh, differently for you than most folks, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it has a way of interrupting your plans uh, for sure. Um, did you finish law school? I did finish law school. It was one of those where if I got on the book contract three months earlier, I probably would never have gone. But by then, my tuition was paid. I was already enrolled. So I got that contract um, October of my 1L year. And the book came out when I was a 2L, which was just hilarious because people you – know, people made a big fuss over it. It was you know Harvard student writes bodice ripper because this was right after Legally Blonde had come out. So Harvard – Harvard Law students were sort of much in the, the cultural ether. And so there were all these, there was a New York Times article about Harvard Law student writes bodice ripper and so on. And so people would sidle up to me in the halls of the law school, including professors being like, are you the one who wrote the book? I've always wanted to write a book. <laughs> and you're like, well, yeah, it was, but it was this thing to make me happy. And <laughs> Yeah, no, it was kind of hysterical. But I got to know so many more people that way. It's amazing what you learn about people, about their secret ambitions. And a lot of them, the sorts of books they wanted to write weren't at all the, the um, things I would have accorded with their public persona. So it was really, really interesting. But yeah, so I did finish law school. I wound up actually, so when I got the contract for that first book, it was a two book contract. <laughs> and the first one was written and my parents were like, okay, have them publish the first one, but there's no way you can do another as a 1L. And I was like, but, but, but no one might let me write another book again. Of course I'm taking it. I'll figure out how I'm doing it later. And so I wound up writing my second book, my second year of law school. And then they signed me up for another two book contract. So when I graduated from law school, I had three books out and a fourth in the works, which was actually, I think made law school a lot easier because I was too busy to stress out. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, did you practice law after that? For the grand total of a year and a half. <laughs> so if you have any legal questions, I am not the person to come to, you know, I'm still technically a member of the bar. But I would not trust myself to lawyer my way out of a wet paper bag, at least not without some serious cramming. Oh, that's amazing. So I'm, I'm assuming the writing took off. Yes. Yeah, so I got really lucky. And that first book, The Secret History of the Pink Carnation, took off like crazy. And sort of being young and naive, I didn't realize just how well it had done at the time, um, which I think is a good thing because it kept me humble and striving. You know, now in retrospect, I realize that 
wow, there were banners in the front of all the Barnes and Nobles. That's actually kind of a thing. <laughs> but at the time, fortunately, I didn't know. Um, so I got I got very lucky with that first book. Um, you know, I would ask a normal person um, how their time in law school has helped their writing career and did it teach you um, good writing habits and, and things like that. But it, it sounds like you were uh, – law school w- was the, the least of your <laughs> writer character building. Um, but did, was there anything in law school that, that you look back uh, today and say, I'm happy I had that experience because it built this in me? Well, it certainly taught me how to consume a lot of caffeine. <laughs> until until law school, I was a tea drinker. <laughs> but when I got to law school, Elena Kagan was our dean, and she had just she had instituted a bunch of reforms to make Harvard law students less miserable because you know this was a thing. Um, bring the suicide rate down, and one of those reforms was free coffee outside the classrooms. And it's like those the Pringles commercials. Once you pop, you can't stop. <laughs> and especially because I was balancing book deadlines and law school. Boy, did I consume that coffee. Wow. But I will say that what, one thing that being a lawyer really helped me with as a writer was learning that deadlines are deadlines. That when you get something, you turn it around fast. And I remember sort of in my early days as a writer, always being amazed at how grateful people were to me when I would turn things back around to them. Because, you know, of course, in my lawyer life, that was expected. You were supposed to get things back, you know, not in 10 minutes, but yesterday. And, you know, I I had not realized that publishing is often much more forgiving about these things. So I think it, it encouraged a habit of discipline that was very useful. Yeah, uh, publishing is, uh, is is full of people hearing the sound of deadlines flying past. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as someone who who believes in deadlines and believes in meeting those, what does your daily writing habit look like? Well, you know, it's changed over time because I've sort of my first book was published so young. My my whole life has happened as I've been a writer. And so my writing schedule has had to adjust with it. Right now, I have a preschooler and a toddler. So my writing day really is bounded by my preschooler's three-hour school day. I drop her off. I run to the nearest Starbucks. And I I have my favorite seat, which I relentlessly claim. It's the seat near the plug. Um, I get my grande caramel macchiato. I plug in my computer. And that's my work time. And then at about five minutes to pick up, I look at my, my the clock on my computer. I panic. I unplug the computer. I save everything, and I run for it and pick her up late again. <laughs> and then I go back into the the routine of, you know, feeding and bathing a toddler and preschooler and all the madness until finally at some point, please God, they're in bed. Some nights this happens earlier than others. And then I catch up with email Facebook, social media, website posts, um, packaging up books to mail to readers, things like that, all the busy work. Um, while my daughter pops repeatedly out of bed, now I'm like, I'm trying to finish. School. So that's what my work day is right now. I'm hoping to get a slightly longer work day back next year when my older child starts kindergarten. So I, I am counting the days until that. When you uh, when you pop into your Starbucks and you've got your macchiato and you're you're sit down at the computer and then you feverishly write for you know the two and a half or three hour window that you have there, um, it, do you do you always know what's coming up for that writing session? Um, and are you an outliner or are you discovering the story as you go? Well, I'm a combo. I'm a combo plotter and pantser, as we call it in the industry. Um, so what always. I have to have some sort of outline, some sense of trajectory, so I know where I'm going. Uh, the problem is that I am very character driven, so I learn my characters as I write them. Often, I feel like it's it's like being at a cocktail party where you're chatting with someone and you sort of think you know them at first, but then the more you talk with them, the more you realize they weren't who you initially thought they were. And that's what it's like with the characters in my book. So as I get to know them, often the things I thought they would do change on me. And then I have to go frantically re-outline. So what I've learned over time is that it works best if I outline about five chapters ahead. And pretty much at the end of every other chapter, I go back and I re-outline. And so I'm always inching ahead bit by bit. But I always know what I'm doing or I think I know what I'm doing for the next three or four chapters. 
I see. So, and, and that helps you when you sit down that there's no waste of time. You, you can jump right in where you know the story's going, but still have the freedom to discover more about the characters and keep the, the characters building along the way. Exactly, or at least that's the plan. Because, you know, sometimes you sit down and your characters just will not do what you think you wanted them to do. And that's where I found there are two sorts of writer's block for me. One is because for whatever reason, my brain is just off. You know, the caffeine hasn't risen to my brain, or it's a sunny (laughs) day. I just really want to go shopping. Or, you know, the littler child was up at three in the morning and I am sleep deprived and you're not dealing well with that. And sometimes it's because there's actually something really wrong with the story. And I have to stop and go for a walk or call my college roommate to try to figure out where I went wrong and why my characters are stuck and where I need to go tear up stuff to go and rewrite and get back to where I should be. So I usually takes me a couple of days to figure out whether a block is what I call I just don't want to or whether it's actually a plot problem. And usually once I've broken through whatever that plot problem is or gone shopping or both, um, I can find, I can suddenly start moving ahead again. Are there any um, any tools or tricks that you've learned to help break through those uh, those plot problems when you run into a brick wall? You know, I find that writing by hand is actually really helpful. That you think differently when you're writing longhand. So sometimes I will just free write on a blank piece of paper. I'll write random notes to myself. These aren't things I save. I'll throw them out after. They're simply part of a thought exercise. That helps. Walking also really helps. I often find that if your your body is doing something else, um, your mind is free to wander. Also, turning off the computer. I have learned that if I turn off the computer, that's almost exactly when I'm going to have that big breakthrough idea, and now I have to boot up again. Um, but it's sort of once you've given yourself license to give up and said, okay, I'm not doing any more today, that's often when your subconscious kicks in and solves it for you. And, of course, the classic, the shower. Um, My husband found me waterproof notepads (laughs) that are actually you stick to the shower wall because before that I was doing crazy stuff like writing messages to myself in soap so I wouldn't forget lines of dialogue or just trailing water through the whole apartment in my race to get to pen and pen to pen and paper. So I have these great waterproof shower notes now. (laughs) You know, I only use them as a last resort because they're kind of annoying, but, you know, it's true. You do often get your best ideas in the shower. In uh – in over 600 episodes of this show, you are the second person to mention waterproof shower notes. Um, that is that is amazing. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to find some and put put uh, in the store on the website or something. That's uh, I, I think more people could use that. Um, you you love historical fiction. Uh, you know, if you're looking through your your back catalog, uh, there are these big amazing epics. Um, you know, beginning with the the farce uh, that. That became, you know, the the door opener for you, uh, you know, and going up to your your new book, The Summer Country. uh, What is it about historical fiction that you love so much? Well, the truth is, I've always wanted to live in another century. Our own always felt so flat and bland with to me um, compared with the past. I think part of it was I grew up with a lapsed historian for a father. My father had been a history professor, but left to become a lawyer. And so by the time I was little, I, you know, by the time I was three or four, he no longer had an audience of students to whom to tell stories, but he had me. So I grew up on all these insane historical family stories and also the classics. Like um, somehow my parents were my father found me these large illustrated Three Musketeers and Last of the Mohicans and Robin Hood. So in many ways, um, these medieval and 17th century characters were much more real to me as a preschooler than the things I saw on the news. I I kept thinking that New York was a semi-detached part of England and that if I walked (laughs) the right way through Central Park, I would run into the sheriff chasing Robin Hood. That's amazing. Um, lapsed historian may be the best thing I've heard today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, have you ever been tempted to write a, a contemporary novel? Oh, absolutely. Because one thing I love doing is comedy and it's actually very hard to write funny historical. I managed to do it with the pink books, but that was because they were their own weird cross genre thing. So I got to be funny. But the kind of historical fiction I'm writing now, which I think of as sort of, you know, variously as either real historical fiction or historical women's fiction, it's much more serious and it's much harder to do madcap. 
because that kind of humor detracts from the historical experience for people. So it's sort of an either or. You can do funny in a kind of historical fantasy land, or you could write a really richly detailed historical novel and give people the experience of living in that era, but you can't be funny in the same way. But with contemporary, you can really get to be funny. So one of these days, I would love to write just a pure comedy of manners, satire sort of thing, because uh, writing comedy is so much fun, and I miss it so um, the new book, which is available everywhere now, The Summer Country, um, takes us through the Victorian era, but we are uh, set in colonial Barbados. Uh, why the setting and what was happening then uh, that intrigued you enough to want to tell a story here? Well, this is one of those books that happened to me <laughs> rather than one of these books I initially intended to write. I was on vacation with my two best friends from the Harvard History Department. And, you know, what do you historians on vacation do? They go and tour historic houses. <laughs> so we went on a plantation tour and the tour guide told us that the plantation house had burned down and in the fire, the owner's Portuguese ward had died. Except that there was a wrinkle. This child, the Portuguese ward, was neither Portuguese nor the owner's ward. Um, it was the owner's child by an enslaved woman. And he had snuck the child into his household by claiming that it was the child of a Portuguese friend to, for whom he had pledged to care. And then, of course, the guide went on to tell us, you know, how after the child died, the owner went mad and spent the rest of his life in a rocking chair on the veranda of the ruined plantation chasing the shadows, which was all very dramatic and gothic. But I wanted to know more about the missing mother. Who was the mother of this child? Had What had happened? Had she agreed to having her child taken away from her? Or had the child been torn from her? Where was she in all this? You know, if the plantationer cared for her and the child, why hadn't he manumitted them? Was he not capable of doing so for some reason? You know, so you know, I had a lot of questions, none of which were answered. And this was not a, a location that I wrote about. Um, my books were set in England and France and all that sort of thing. Not in the Caribbean, but this story haunted me. And I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I started reading up on the colonial Caribbean and particularly colonial Barbados. And I think it's often those areas that we don't know as much about that really catch our imaginations as writers, because everything is new and fascinating and strange to you. And you notice all sorts of details that when you're dealing with more familiar places or time periods, you might be offhand about. And actually, one of the things I love, so the, the summer country is set in two time periods, it starts in Barbados in the 18 teens, where we first, you know, basically we, we discover the story of the Portuguese ward, where there's a forbidden love affair between a plantation owner and an enslaved woman on a neighboring plantation. And it goes from the 18 teens to the 1850s when a young woman, a young English woman, inherits a plantation in Barbados and goes over there to find out why her grandfather left her this plantation that no one ever knew he owned. And so the two stories interweave as we go back and forth and find out how my vicar's daughter, Emily, in 1854, is connected to these characters, um, this enslaved woman, Jenny, and this child who everyone's pretending is Portuguese back in the 18-teens. And I spent, well, I spent 12 books um, in my Pink Carnation series writing about the 18-teens, but not in, well, in the early 19th century, but not in the Caribbean. And so I'm very familiar with England in that period. So it was particularly fascinating to me seeing what life was like in another part of the world at the same time, where you have people going back and forth between Barbados and London, and these cultural mores are mixing and conflicting, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And then moving the story forward to the 1850s and having that as a, a bit of a framing device, um, did that open up new possibilities to um, to expand away from the, the time period that you were f so familiar with, even though it's a, a different setting? Uh, but did you know moving it forward a, a few decades did that open up some other possibilities to you? Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that fast has always fascinated me is, you know, we do tend from our modern standpoint to assume that the past is all olden times. 
and that everything was a certain way before. But of course, you get such big changes within a few decades. And so I love the contrast between um, the 18 teens, where you're sort of in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, and there are all these enlightenment ideas flying around. Um, and that in many ways, um, it's a period of great energy. And then by the 1850s, we've moved into really the high Victorian era. And roles for women in particular have changed. This is when you get the idea of the angel of the hearth the growth of the suburbs, where women are supposed to be sort of the guardians of hearth and household, where suddenly they're wearing these big crinolines and they're meant to be these angelic domestic presences, which wasn't the case, you know, two generations before. And so you get the contrast between um, this, in many ways, very bourgeois, very um, manner-bound Victorian world and the much wilder Georgian era that preceded it. Right. Um, you're, you're dealing with, um, very, uh, strange political, um, uh, happenings, uh, during here and, and something that is completely foreign to us when you're, you're dealing with, um, plantation owners and enslaved people and, and, and all of this, where do you begin to do research to do, um, a story like this justice? Well, this is where I'm very lucky I had my grad school years. Um, One of my very good friends from grad school, who's a professor at NYU now, is now doing Caribbean topics. And so I called her and said, who do I need to read? You know, who are the experts on Barbados? Where do I need to start? And between my good friend Becky and this amazing research librarian in Georgia named Vicki Vicki Parsons, I assembled a 10-page long bibliography of both secondary and primary sources. And of course, you know, one thing you're trained to do in grad school is you learn how to track down people's footnotes. So I would read one monograph and then go, you know, mark down, you know, highlight everything in the footnotes that looked interesting, and then go and hunt down all of those books or, you know, those documents. And fortunately for me in our internet age, and this is a big difference from when I started writing historical fiction back in 2003, so much of the stuff is now digitized. There are actual handwritten plantation records from Barbados from just the time periods I was looking at that are now you can get them by typing in a URL into your computer and they'll pop up on the screen. Um, Or, for example, um, part of a big part of the 1854 part of the book is a truly devastating cholera epidemic that ravaged Barbados in the summer of 1854. And there is someone who lived through it, um, a minister living in Bridgetown, wrote a very detailed firsthand account, a sort of day by day of this cholera epidemic. And it's available online. It's just it's amazing what you can get your hands on these days. But, yeah, this was a book where because because of the political issues we were dealing with, because of slavery and all of these heartrending topics, I felt like I really owed it to my characters to make sure that I researched this book like I have never researched anything before. So I spent about two solid years researching this book before I started writing it. Well, that was going to be my question. Um, you know, one temptation when tackling a book like this is that in the in the research that you do, that you just get lost in the research and the book never comes out of that because there's just so much to learn and so much to discover. Um, how do you know when you know enough or, or when you, when you, how do you know when you have a starting point? Because we, you know, we all reference back to things as we need it. Um, I'm not saying that you're just completely knowledgeable, but a hundred percent, but when do you come to the point to say, okay, now I'm ready to tackle this. Well, some of it is a question of pure practicality, because, of course, you know, when you're writing that first book, you have all the time in the world. Or, you know, there was an older model where people used to take a lot of time to write books. One of my favorite books of all time is MMK's The Far Pavilions, which is a thousand page doorstopper set in colonial India. And I think it took her. I always get the number wrong. It's either nine or eleven years to research and write it. And these days, if you did that, your publisher would be on the phone, being like, "Hello, are you still alive?" So for a very long time, I was actually on a one book a year schedule. Then, for a brief and insane period of time, I was actually writing two books a year, which 
substantially limited the amount of research time I had. And so for this book, this was a book I had wanted to write for so long that had haunted me for such a long period of time. And I knew there was so much research involved. So I, I got them to push this book back a bit so I could have more time to research. But I did still have a deadline <laughs> breathing down my neck. So at some point, I knew that I had to stop researching and just write or I was not going to get the book in on time and people were going to be very angry with me. And everything comes full circle back to those deadlines. Um, the the new book is The Summer Country. Um, Lauren, this is a fascinating uh, book and one that uh, that I know people are going to get just completely lost in. Um, it's out of it's available everywhere now. Uh, hardcover, uh, audio book, Kindle edition. Uh, if people are just discovering you and want to get uh, into your back catalog and learn more about you and follow along with what's going on, uh, is there a place they can connect with you online? Oh, absolutely. Please come visit me at my website at www.laurenwillig.com. I also adore procrastinating by interacting with readers on my Facebook author page, which is also just, you know, Facebook slash Lauren Willig. And you can also find me on Instagram where I post a combination of random pictures of my kids' stuff and book stuff. <laughs> um, and if that's also, I'm, at, I'm just Lauren Willig over there. So you, if you sort of plug in Lauren Willig on any of these social media things, you can find me. The only place you won't really find me is Twitter. I'm technically on Twitter, but I never really got into it. But I'm always over on my Facebook author page or my website or Instagram. So please, please come find me there. Ask me any questions you like about the books or the summer country or how you write with small people. I am so happy to answer any of it. Excellent. Uh, Lauren, we're going to send everybody to see you. I'll put links to all that in the show notes at hankgarner.com. Uh, Lauren, it's been so much fun talking with you. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much, Hank. This was great. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run, but now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge. A shape of some sort. He stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids, flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Crane, Jason Crane, Jason Crane. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bain, Ekdal, Forest, Black, Small. There, 
he saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay, just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. Some Halloween thing. Maybe? For some event? He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider, standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless? 